He's just too excited to talk about site prep. <laughs> Um, all right, so we'll get started right now. It's a couple minutes after the hour. Thank you, everyone, both in person and on Zoom. If you can't hear me or having issues, let us know. Um, for coming to our site prep workshop, this is our second event within this past year for the Pollinator Initiative, and really excited to have you guys. Um, we have Chris Mahoney from NRCS here, and he's going to be answering all the nitty gritty questions on site prep. But first I'll kind of go through a little intro here. So, so if you didn't know, this week is actually National Stewardship Week. I'm part of the National Association of Conservation Districts. So here we are the Gallatin Conservation District. It was put into law sometime in the 40s maybe that each county in the United States of America has a conservation district. They can go by different names, but here we're the GCD and they're celebrating National Stewardship Week. Um, it's one of their largest programs to promote natural resource conservation. And they've been starting it since, or this has been um, something they recognized since 1955. And it just kind of reminds us all of our responsibilities that we have for our natural resources. And I think the Pollinator Initiative fits in perfectly when it comes to supporting our natural resources here in Gallatin County. Um, so the theme of the National Search Week this year is healthy soil, healthy life. Again, couldn't be better for a site prep workshop about getting some native plants in the ground to help our pollinators. So we have a link here. Um, I can send out the presentation and we're also going to put this on our website, a recording once we're done. So if anyone asks questions, it will be recorded, but it's a safe space here. So if you wanna learn more about National Stewardship Week, it's okay, that happens all the time. It's, it's so annoying. Um, you can check out that link. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's fine. I do it like every board meeting all the time. Um, so the Gallatin Pollinator Initiative, if you aren't familiar, started here at the GCD in September of 2020. So we're not even two years old, but it was um, originally started in Lake County Conservation District in 2016, spreading across the state of Montana, which is just really great to see. And I actually made this slideshow maybe like a couple of weeks ago. And so we now have about 100 participants. So two, 10 new people have joined since I made this slide. So we're growing and growing rapidly, which is of course great to see. Oh no, Bill. Uh oh. <laughs> oh, <laughs> she's not a Mac user, everybody. It's okay. It's okay. Okay, so if you are not already a member of the program, it's super easy. All you have to do is fill out an interest form that we have online, just a Google form that asks, asks a couple questions about what your site currently looks like, kind of your goals as a landowner, um, if you have any site prep methods in mind. A lot of people say, I don't know, help me. And that's what we're here for. We really like to use this form as a way to work individually with the landowners and make sure that we can have um, a pollinator plot that works for the pollinators as well as works for the time and effort that you're willing to give towards maintenance as well as you know the aesthetics and what you want your plot to look like. So next, picking up your seed, we do for those here today have the seed if you haven't picked it up yet, but of course we're open Monday to Friday nine to four four-ish, depending on how we're feeling. And so can always set up a time with me. We can, <laughs> can get you guys that seed or we're around the county a lot. And so if we are in a convenient spot, we can try and drop it off as well. And then prepping your site, which is the focus of this workshop. This is where the most, where the bulk of the work comes in. Proper site prep really leads to a successful plot. And then hopefully if you do that well enough and your plot gets established, then the long-term maintenance shouldn't be um, the most daunting. And then, yeah, and then you see, and then cross your fingers, water, do a little weeding, and hope things grow. Yeah, <laughs> 
We love technology doctors. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's all my little intro spiel, and I'll introduce Chris Mahoney. He is our local NRCS agent, and he's going to tell us everything we need to know about Cypro. Thanks. Thank you, folks, for having me. Um, I want to thank you all for being here today, for sure. Um, there's a couple of things I want to get out first is there's no wrong way and there's no absolute right way. Okay, so what I'm going to put out there today uh, is kind of a generalized um, way of getting pollinators into the ground and to germinate. But there are many different ways. Okay, so if you have a situation and what I said you tried doesn't work, doesn't mean that you messed up. There's different ways to do this, okay? So I have three main goals for today. One is to introduce myself. So I'm Chris Mahoney. I work for the NRCS. So you can check that one off. <laughs> so the other is, so I'm getting there, right? <laughs> okay, there we go. So, um, but the second goal is to provide you folks with something useful that you can take home with today. And then the third kind of goes along with that is, if I'm not able to get you something useful, at least we'll provide you with some resources and you can go find that stuff yourself. So the Natural Resources Conservation Service is NRCS. We are an agency under the Department of Agriculture. We work with agricultural producers and non-industrial forest uh, landowners. So we have a number of programs throughout the county on the next slide here. I'm gonna just show you what we have out there and then we'll get into the pollinator stuff. So if we could hit the next slide, please. Absolutely. So here's a map of Gallatin County. And I just, I know you can't really see this, but I just want to provide you some um, visuals of what's available. I'm sorry. Can I take a picture? Oh, of course, yeah. So we have a number of different programs that are available for folks. So over here in the Bridger Bank Tales, we have a forestry fuels reduction um, project. We have the Joint Chiefs, which is the screen over, it kind of covers some of that ground, but it comes with a lot across the Galton Gateway, the front. That's all forestry fuels reduction type work. Then we have in this purple is uh, what we have is a program for to improve water quality through our National Water Quality Initiative. And that's in the Camp Creek, Godfrey Creek drainages. And then we also have this purple area. And if you live within this and you have animals and they're in confinement, when I say confinement, means that wherever you keep them, there's no grass growing anymore. And typically it's either that or if they're in a confinement for 45 days. We have a program to help you move those off of a live, of live water. So if they're right next to a stream, we wanna to try to improve the water quality by moving those animals in a high and dry location where they're not gonna negatively impact the water quality. So that's my quick spiel. Um, NRCS, we have a webpage, Montana webpage. Um, and I don't know if I included it here, but if you Google Montana NRCS, our webpage will come up and then there's a link that says what's available in my county. And they have every county in Montana listed. And each county has different things available in their counties. So all these programs will come up and there'll be more details about how to apply, what the program's for, so on and so forth. So I'd highly recommend if you're interested in any NRCS programs, check that out. Okay, so we can move on to the next slide. So pollinators, right? So we're talking about bees, moss, bats, anything that can move pollen from one plant to another. So in fact, insects can be pollinators too, although they're kind of like an accidental pollinator, right? Um, but most pollinators or all pollinators have two main habitat requirements, right? They need a place to get the nectar and they need a place to live and nest. So, in our talk today, we're gonna to try to provide them with both of these um, situations. So if we go on to the next slide. So this, I'm not gonna to talk too much, because like I said earlier, I'm not an expert on bees or pollinators per se. I'm more of an expert 
an expert. Um, <laughs> so I know a little bit more about habitat and getting the habitat you want um, to provide for these animals. So we can go on. Unless, did everyone see this long enough? So we're, really today, we're gonna talk about these five items in a little bit more depth. Um, so the site selection, before you even get anything going, you kind of figure out, okay, where do I want this? How big do I want this? And one thing I put that out there really to begin with is I would recommend going smaller to start versus going bigger. Because if you're gonna start disturbing some ground, you're gonna get some weeds, right? So then the larger of an area you disturb, the larger a weed issue you potentially will have. Regardless if weeds come in or not, you're gonna have a larger maintenance issue. So just think about when you guys get started, what am I able to maintain? And how much time do I want to devote to this? Do you just wanna plant some stuff, work on it for the first year and then let it go? Or are you more interested in each year you're going to add stuff, subtract stuff? Are you going to be really involved? That's just stuff that you have to think about in your own minds, right? So when you're picking the plants and how dense of a planting you want, all those things, and irrigation or not. So if we can go on to the next slide. We'll get into these in more depth. As we so this is... I don't know if you folks are familiar with the web soil survey. That is a really, really good resource. And we're gonna try to get on that real quick here to just show you folks. I highly, highly recommend this website. Um, what it is, once we get it up, it'll be a picture of the United States. You can, you can zoom in to your yard and you can find out what soils you have on your property. Is the soil good for a septic tank? Is it good for plants? What type of plants? What would be the productivity of it be? Um, there's a, almost, there's over a hundred different things you can find on that website. Once you define your area of interest and once we have it pulled up or maybe we won't get that pulled up today, <laughs> but yes, sir. Oh, um, can we see the website? That's where yes. I think we're working on right uh, now. But well, I, I don't think I want it to address. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. So web soil survey, if you oh, just okay. type that in. Just type that in. This is the page you go to right off the bat. And what you want to do is hit this green button. And that's going to bring up a picture of the United States. Sorry, did we go too fast? So. We're also going to have this recorded. You can find online, which would be cool. So now what you wanna do is you pick this button here. You wanna zoom in, you'll zoom in to Montana here. We've been zoomed in a little too quick. <laughs> <laughs> zoom out. Where are we at, where are we at? So we wanna go down here. Oh. Oh, the drag button? Yeah. There we go. You can tell I've never used this website. Mm -hmm. Okay, here we are. Yeah, just, and you can actually. Sorry. That's okay. There we go. So yes. now at this point, this AOI button is defining your area of interest. That's what the AOI stands for. I would recommend using this, that way you can just do a polygon. You can just kind of click. So let's go into Gallatin here somewhere and we'll just click in here and just do a pretty small little. Oh, yeah. yeah, you have to click it all the way. Yeah, and then double click the last one. And now it's gonna zoom right into that. So this is your area of interest. So now you go up to the top tab here, soil map. And that's gonna show you where your soils are on this property. So these are all the different soils on this property. It tells you what they are, how many acres they are, what percentage of the whole property. So then if we go to Soil Data Explorer, and I, I know I'm going through this real quick. And if anyone has any questions later, we could definitely go through this a little bit more depth. 
So this is where you can get information on your specific property because you've already identified this is the property you want information on. So you go to vegetative productive, go to the drop down. There's all these different things. So you could get, oh, what, what would the range production in a normal year be? Say you were someone who had a bunch of cows and you wanted to figure out how many cows can I put on this property? So then you view right description, here. or I'm sorry, view rating. So then it'll tell you, okay, on this, this soil, which is this, the name of that soil is this, this is about how much you could expect to, it to produce in a year, right? And this is how many acres. But this is just one example. Like, so if we close out this, you can go, there's all kinds, I mean, military operations, I don't even know, <laughs> but I mean, land classification, building site, it has a ton of information. It's a great resource. So I'm gonna close out of this. This is the highlight of the talk. <laughs> all down here from this. Okay, so now we have our soils information. You thought about how big of a pollinator plot do you want? Is it going to be a half acre, quarter acre, 20 acres, 200 acres, that sort of thing? So these are some things you probably want to think about as you're doing that. Is the, is the plot going to have pesticide drift come over on top of it? Or is it nearby some other farmer's fields? Have there been pesticides applied in that spot prior? So we were talking earlier, some chemicals have residuals, so it can live in the soil, or not live, but it can exist in the soil for a few years. So there's some chemicals that will kill everything for a number of years. So no matter what you do to your soil in site prep, you won't get anything to grow. So then also, these are some other things. I'll just go through them pretty quick, but sunlight, do you want them shaded or do you want full sun? Do you want both? Think of it. So when you're out on your property and you're looking at your spot, you want to look around, okay, the sun's coming here, it's setting there, it's going to be in full sun all day. That'll help you with your plant selection. Slope, of course, you don't want to plant stuff on too steep of a slope. Or you also don't want to, like if you had a good grass hillside, you don't want to tear all that grass out in a period of time where you might have some excessive erosion. So you might not want to, so say you did have a site and was on a hill and that was the spot you had to have. I would not recommend prepping that site during early spring when you're going to get a whole <coughs> bunch of water and rain, right? So that might be just something to think about in your minds. What's going to happen over the next couple of weeks while my plants are getting established? If I have a whole bunch of rain, is there going to be a runoff event? Is it going to wash all my seed away? Am I going to get erosion? And also, and this is a huge one that you folks definitely take, take into serious consideration. Do you have existing weeds out there now? Because if you do, you're going to have more once you start this down this road. So I try to get as many of the weeds that are out there under control prior to doing any work. Noxious weeds are a whole nother thing. You don't want to get in trouble with your HOA or other neighbors because those will really take advantage. And weeds are designed to really come in early and fast on disturbed sites. So if you had a site that was as well prepared as possible, but there were some weeds nearby, those weeds will probably germinate and start growing before your pollinators. And then they'll overtop them and then they'll shade them out and they'll, they'll produce more and you'll get more and more weeds and less and less pollinators. So site history, that's kind of important too. Is this site, was there an old dairy from this site? Is there gonna be issues? Was it a petroleum site? Just think about, just because it's your yard, you don't know what's happened there the last 20 years, right? So you might think about, okay, and there's aerial photography to go back in time to look at too. And that's not as critical as some of these others, but I would just recommend keeping in the back of your mind, what's been on this site before? How is that gonna impact my pollinators? Soils and habitat, we talked about soils, um, habitat, 
we'll talk about that some more. Are you going to do irrigation? Are this, are this is this going to be a dry land situation where they don't get any irrigation? Maybe they get watered in to begin with. <clears throat> Maybe not. Or are you going to put sprinklers out there? One thing I would recommend too is if you are going to water, typically what happens, and you'll see this in your gardens too, is the, the garden area or the pollinator area needs to kind of come to an equilibrium. So when you first seed it and you water the heck out of it, everything's going to come up. But over time, as those plants mature, their water needs will start to stabilize, right? So if you're providing excess of water, other plants will come in and start to utilize that. So at some point, you need to figure out how much water do you need to put out there if you're going to put any at all. But just consider that when you're first starting the pollinator plot is that you're probably going to use water to get stuff going. But over time, when you start to wean that water off, kind of make sure you're not overwatering, but you also, of course, you don't want to underwater. And that underwatering is pretty easy to see. And then I just add this, um, the site might provide other opportunities. Um, it might be a spot where you have the um, rain gutters coming out where they get some extra water. Take, a, take advantage of those types of spots. Okay. So we talked about some of this already. So the size, that's super important, right? Are we doing irrigated versus dry land? Okay, so now we have a site, but we need to control the existing vegetation. There's a couple of different methods to do that. So tillage is pretty straightforward. Um, you're going in there with either a machine or a tractor and you're rototilling the soil, you're mixing it all up, you're killing stuff. But also at the same time, you're also destroying the habitat of the microbes, the soil life that's below ground, right? So imagine if you were an earthworm and you're just kind of hanging out and all of a sudden a giant rototiller comes through. If it doesn't kill you, it's probably destroyed your home, right? So then you gotta start from scratch and build it up. I would recommend, or I would suggest that if you're just working on a small garden area or less than an acre, rototilling once or twice to get stuff going isn't gonna be all that detrimental to that soil. Because you're probably gonna be adding a whole bunch of stuff into it down the road, and you're not gonna be disturbing it every year. The tillage is something that we just don't wanna encourage folks to use as a tool every year to kind of maintain their weekly seed bed. Solarization, that's where you're putting a sheet over the soil, lets it heat up, so you'd have to keep that out there for a while. It's about 90% effective. Typically, when you pull it off, you'll see most of that grass is dead. Um, you'll want to remove most of that because you won't be able to plant the seed unless you actually go into the ground with a shovel or something. But if you're going to broadcast, that's not going to work because you need the seed to have good soil contact. So if you just seed over the top of some grass, that seed's just going to sit there and dry out. Same thing if you're in a situation, and we were talking about this earlier, if you do till off the ground and you put some seed out there, but there might be some straggling um, plant roots around, raking that out is a good idea. Because if your seed touches any of that old plant material, that'll dry that seed out. It just pulls the moisture away from the seed. And chemical. So there are a number of different chemicals you can use. There's stuff that just kills grass. There's stuff that just kills broad leaves. And there's stuff that kills everything, right? I would just highly recommend reading the label, knowing what you're getting into. And like I mentioned earlier, some of these chemicals have a residual, so it can last in the soil for a number of years. So one scenario is you might come in and use a grass killer to kill all the grass. But say that grass killer has a residual of one year or 12 months. So maybe the first year you just plant the forbs, the, the flowering plants, and maybe the next year you plant a little bit of grass. And we do recommend having a little bit of grass in your pollinator 
and you know, I'll have a slide here, but you don't, typically don't want to have more than 25% in the mix because that grass will eventually overtake the forbs or the pollinators, the flowering plants. And then also when you're getting grass, you want bunch grass. So there's really two main types and that's going to be in another slide, but I'm talking about it now. So um, bunch grass, which is typically kind of comes down to a B and it's like a bunch, right? But then there's also rhizomatous grass, which is like what Kentucky bluegrass is. So it grows together. So you don't want that rhizomatous grass in your pollinators because that'll grow all throughout and will eventually outcompete. Whereas a bunch grass will typically just stay in that spot. It might expand a little bit and it'll produce seeds, but the seeds are what produces a new plant. It's not rhizomes coming in from under the ground. And then cover crops, you can use those in coordination. If you're, um, if you do some tillage, you're likely gonna get some weeds and some grass or whatever was there prior. Because typically um, seed in the ground will last a few years. Every species is a little different. Some lives a year, some will live a hundred years. So even if you kill everything, there might've been some seed in the ground. And once you till it up, gives it the opportunity to kind of flush because there's no competition anymore. So that's where if you do cover crops, that cover crops acts as a competition. And also you can manage those cover crops. So if you have like a compaction issue or you have some other issues with your soil, you can tailor your cover crop to try to address that just using plants. Okay. So just here are some quick examples. Um, obviously, this is a tractor tilling the ground up. So this is a method that I've done myself, but it hasn't worked great. You pull out the sod, but then you got to do something with this right here, because that's going to grow new grass right off the bat. Um, so this is that solarization I was talking about, where they cover their ground with either black plastic, and some people even use clear. I don't know if there's one better than the other. And this um, is a site where they use the chemical. So they just killed everything. So we got there. Sorry, that's my phone. <laughs> that's why I put it in there. <laughs> okay, so this is where I was saying we do recommend having some grass in your mix. So diversity is super important for all plants, all animals. So having some grass here and there in your pollinator planting will really provide some good habitat for your pollinators. So I was talking earlier, and that goes back to one of those slides in the beginning. You want some standing dead, you want some other vertical structure, um, you want some hiding places, and grass can provide that. It also will capture some snow and moisture. It might provide some shade or some uh, windbreak for your other pollinators. Forbs, so this is your flowering plants. And as you can see, we have, there's a number of pictures, but also we have some publications that have a whole bunch of different forbs you can use. And we have one that talks about when their flowering period is early, mid season or late season. And we recommend having at least three, right? One early season, one mid season, one late season. And if it was me, I'd probably do three of each. That way you're covered, right? So there's something always blooming in your pollinator. Shrubs will also provide pollination. You know, they provide flowering plants as well. Same thing with trees. And they, they can provide some additional benefits just like that grass. We do want some bare ground. I know this is kind of like goes against a lot of what we talk about. Um, typically bare ground is gonna encourage weeds to come in. But we do need a little bit of bare ground for some nesting sites. So somewhere in your pond here, I would provide some bare ground. And then the standing dead, yeah, that, so you, I think most of you probably have heard no mow may, right? So we're trying to provide habitat long enough for those bees to come out of hibernation. Is that, are the bees hibernating? I guess they are. Um, <laughs> And, but if you start to clean all that stuff up now, you're gonna be destroying their habitat and potentially uh, killing pollinators. Go on. 
on to the next one. So this is just a slide to illustrate the diversity of different types of plants. I love this slide. I use it all the time. So all these plants are pulling water at different points in the soil, but they're also pulling nutrients from different portions of the soil. And then also above ground too, they're providing different vertical structure. So this is all providing a diversity of habitat for your pollinators. Go ahead. So um, plants, plant selection. So first question is cool season or warm season? So right here in Montana, most of our plants are cool season. There are a few warm season, like little blue stem and a few others out there that you'll find in different spots. So I would recommend probably you want to stick with more of the cool season. Um, if you can, I think the Indian rice grass is a warm season actually, um, which is fine, but you want to have some diversity if you can, but I'm just letting you know that you'll have better luck or more success with the cool season grasses. The warm season, you're going to have to definitely provide them with more care to get them going. And then this is what we talked about earlier, the bunch grass versus the sod farmer. I'm not going to go all over that again, but just be aware that grass can either be a bunch grass or a sod farmer. And I call that rhizoma. Okay. So when are you going to see this, right? So you, you do all this work, you get your ground prepared. I would recommend probably early spring now, about now is probably a good time. Um, you could do it late summer where it's still warm enough. Everything is going to germinate. You want to leave enough time that the plants can get up and up so that they'll survive the winter. You can also do a dormant seeding where you seed it like in October, November, where you just lay the seed in the ground. It does not germinate and it will germinate the next following spring. Some plants require that you plant them in the fall. So I was staying with the Indian rice grass. I believe that's one of those. That needs what they call a cold stratification. So it needs a period of cold, moist weather to break down that seed coat so it can actually germinate. You can put that in a refrigerator and I would definitely look at what species you have. So you could put the seed on like a, on a, like a paper towel and just wet that a little bit, put it in a, um, Ziploc bag and put it in your fridge for a couple of weeks. Each plant species is going to have different requirements. But like I said, I think for most situations, I would recommend seeding in the spring. Another reason to potentially seed in the fall would be access. If you can't get out there in a timely manner, you might do it in the fall. Then also, so then you have the seed, and we're going to talk about seed and pure live seed here in a couple of minutes. But are you gonna broadcast it or are you gonna drill it? So a drill, typically use a tractor, pull behind a drill or pull a drill behind a tractor. Um, that might be more than what you folks wanna use, but they also have smaller ones too that you can just use by hand. When, when we use that, um, when we say drill, that's getting that seed right into the soil. Right, so that's actually preferred. The broadcast is when you're just spreading the seed on the surface, but if possible, you'd want to harrow it. And I don't know if you folks know what a harrow is, but harrow essentially is just, you think of uh, like a chain link fence and you just lay it on its side and you drag it along the ground and you'd want to have a couple of points that are just roughing up the surface a little bit. And the whole point to that is just to throw a little bit of dirt on the seed. And then if you can't do that, but if you have a roller, they typically most of the landscape companies in town will have rollers you can rent. So you could roll the seed into. If you're not able to do those, we recommend you double the seeding rate. And the seeding rate for pollinators can be pretty, or the cost of pollinators can be fairly expensive. 
right? So something to consider. One thing uh, we do run into sometimes with when you are utilizing a drill is some of this seat is really fluffy and it doesn't flow through the drill. So then we recommend carriers and some people can use corn, corn hoss, um, some other types of products that help to make it flow through the, the drill. Question real quick. Sure. For the broadcast, you said double the seating rate if you can't pair or roll? Or yes, roll. if you can. Yeah, and if you can, you don't really need to. But we, we recommend if you aren't able to roll or harrow to double the rate. Yes, sir. Um, what about raking? Can you rake it? Yeah, okay. raking is just like a harrow. Okay. Yeah. We also had a question online that is this is just a good time. They said, sure. how do you keep, and this you may have kind of answered this, birds from munching on the seed that you broadcasted? Get a cat. <laughs> I don't really know. I honestly, I, Maybe put a <laughs> no, don't do that. Don't do that. Put a, um, that. an owl, like a fake owl, on okay. a post or something. That'll keep a lot of birds away. Um, noise, having some stuff that kind of flutters in the wind. Maybe you have to get creative on that. Right? <laughs> but that is a concern. Sometimes what you can do too, and I didn't put this in the slide. And what I do personally is I we'll put some straw over the top and the straw will help keep the birds off of it. They don't see it as easily. Um, one thing with the straw is you don't want it so thick that when the seed starts to germinate, it's not gonna get enough light, right? So the straw has to be fairly thin. Um, and if you, you can run into problems with straw, if there's weeds in the straw. So I would recommend if you do get straw, you get weed free straw. There shouldn't be any seeds, but there always is. So just be aware that you might be bringing stuff in that you didn't want if you bring in straw. But it helps keep the ground moist. It helps with the germination. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Did we not get this? You didn't get it. Okay. <laughs> so then this is probably the hardest part, right? So you got it going. Everything came up. Now you have to manage it, right? You, how do you keep the weeds out? So one of the things we recommend for our folks right off the bat is to mow the whole, the whole thing the first year and mow it pretty high. You wanna mow it at least six inches uh, because if you go a little too low, you might be impacting growing points. I'm not gonna get into the growing points, but growing points are on a plant. And if you cut those off, the plant, it's really gonna damage the plant and set it back. It has to re grow those growing points and then start growing again. So mowing, if you mow, mow high. Um, you Maybe you can just go out and clip. You might be able to just spot spray some areas. So disturbance. So there's some species that really like to have an open area. So you'd have to go in every few years and kind of pull out stuff. So it's more of an open situation for those plants. Some really like to be overgrown. But I would recommend just, if you, if you have a large enough, maybe you disturb one spot over here, or you mess and leave this spot, and then as over time, you rotate those. Okay. So this, is, once again, this is some more information that I don't really know all that much I found out. It's not really related to habitat. Well, I guess it is, but it's good information. I mean, I didn't really, I didn't realize way back when that a lot of bees will live in the soil. I always thought they were in a hive somewhere, right? <laughs> That's not true. So take a look and I'll move on in case you're ready. I'll post the slides online too if you want to go through them at your own pace. So in a sec, I'm going to get into the seed stuff, and that's super important. So quality seed, and I'm going to talk about pure live seed. Um, does anyone know what I mean when I say pure live seed? Okay. So by the end of this, hopefully everyone does know. <laughs> so um, this is where we were talking about earlier. I think I had 25% grass. So 15 to 25% grass species, but you really want to stay with the bunch grasses. You want to really try to control what you have out there. 
if you have a grown grass, and a lot of you folks might not know what type of grass you have, and that's okay. Just know that some species are harder to kill and persist longer, and they're able to grow from like a little piece of root versus other species boom. So just to be aware of that. Typically, you're not seeding very deep, and that's the beauty with the pollinators. You can get some good germination just by broadcasting and just having a tiny bit of dirt on the, over the top of them. Calibrating your drill, if you are gonna drill it, it's, it can be a little difficult because the seeds are usually, we're not doing a large area. And by the time you calibrate your drill, all your seed is out the back, um, but we can help with that. You always wanna have good firm seed bed. You don't want it so that when you walk out there that your foot sinks in like a, a foot or two. Well, not a foot, but <laughs> that'd be really bad, right? So you don't want it to really sink in more than a quarter inch, long and short of that. And that's what I was talking about, mow. Mowing is kind of your friend when you're first starting out. And also what mowing does too, is if you do have some good germination with some forbs, every time you mow it, it's just gonna have the plant split. So it's just gonna get bushier and bushier. Definitely wanna take care of any noxious weeds. And that's something that I really wanna emphasize. Okay. So here is what we use at the NRCS to do our um, design for, for pollinators or for any planting. So typically we'll pick out, okay, what's the species? we want, but then also, okay, what is the percent of each species that we want out there? And that's gonna equal 100. So on this particular instance, we want alfalfa to be 10% of the mix. We know this information is out there, how many pounds of seed you need for a full stand. So if you had an acre of ground, you would put five pounds of pure live seed down of alfalfa. To cover that would be what you'd want for that one acre. But since we're only going um, 10%, so it's only going to be 25 pounds of pure live seed that we need. Does everyone get that? That's pretty straightforward. Okay. Next slide. And if you join the pollinator initiative, we did all of this for you. <laughs> Which is good and bad because then you don't get to customize it, right? <laughs> True. But you could go out and buy your own seed. You can always add. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, is this different? No, yeah, this is good. Okay. So this is our certification sheet. And the next slide will help explain this. But so we already decided we needed 0.1, or I must have changed it, but we wanted 0.1 pounds of pure live seed of alfalfa. When we bought it, from the store, the bulk rate, when you buy seed from like a Murdoch's or online, typically the seed will be in bulk. And when I say bulk, that means that it's not just the seed you wanted, but it's also the chafe, which might be like the straw, it might have some weeds in there, might have some other species. And what I'll show you next here will kind of explain that. On this, if you're gonna invest your time and energy, I recommend getting it from a reputable seed dealer. And they will give you a seed tag for every bag you get that will give you the percent germination, percent purity. So I should have had these slides switched and I apologize. But on this one, alfalfa, and you'll see the seed tag next, came in at 98% purity, 97% germination, you times those two by this, and that gives you the percent of your pure live seed that you wanted to add to your mix. I did not do a great job explaining that, but if we go to the next slide, and this one's gonna be a little blurry, but this is from Circle S Seeds. So they give you the pounds over here. So this is the bulk pounds they give you. So this is 0.59, I believe. But then they had the purity was at 99%, the germination was at 95%. So you times this 
by this, by this, and that gives you your pure live seed. So could we go back? back yeah. Here, sorry? So coming back, yeah. So then that's where we plug in these numbers here to get the pure live seed. So when you folks are out buying seed or looking at seed, you definitely want to consider pure live seed numbers because if you can go back one more. So we know these are bit proven rates for so this five pounds of pure live seed has been proven to give you a full stand of alfalfa over an acre. So you want five pounds of pure live seed if you have an acre. So the pure live seed is super important. All right. I think we're almost at the end. So this is just an example of some other information that's available out there that has done a bunch of this work. So these are some species. This is the full rate, the pure live seed rate. You know how much precip they need. And then the bloom period. And then is it easy to get them? What's the cost? And there's a bunch of this information that's out there. Um, especially, uh, I would re highly recommend checking out NRCS website. I think you folks probably have some of this information on your website as well. So. There's uh, plenty of opportunity to get the information. If you don't, I left a, my business card here in the corner. You can absolutely call me. Um, I'll get in touch with the conservation district. And that's one of the beauties here in Bozeman. We have a lot of folks that are able to help between ourselves, the conservation district, the extension, the Gallatin Watershed Council, believe it or not. I mean, there's a lot of groups out there that can help you with this. Okay. And I just put this up here. These are two, two publications we use quite a bit. And I believe I brought them out too. So they should be somewhere out here. But if you wanted to write those down, um, that's for your, your benefit. So do you folks have questions? I know that was quick. I, I get to keep talking. Yes, sir. Does the fertilizer and alkalinity matter? So we typically don't recommend fertilizing the first year, especially. Alkalinity does matter, right? So you got extra excess of salts in your soil. So at that situation, you might amend the soil. So there's a number of different ways you can amend alkaline soil. But I would go light, start small. I'm sorry. Well, I was just wondering how with, with the planting of the seed, how do we know what we need to get for for alkalinity, for example? Oh, so so you go to that web soil survey, right? So you know what you got to kind of have starting as a base, right? Um, and then you also want to know there's information on e each plant is going to require a different thing. So I wouldn't get too hung up on pH and alkalinity and acidity unless you have a serious problem. Most of the plants will do okay between six and eight. So it's quite a bit of a range, you know, from acid, acid condition at six to an alkalinity situation at eight, eight, five even. Um, but you wanna look, uh, and when you're looking at this, the plants that you wanna put, that some are more sensitive than others. So it's just gonna depend on the plant. But we don't recommend generally fertilizing the first year because what you, when you fertilize, you're just feeding weeds probably because the weeds are gonna come up no matter what, I guarantee you. And they're really good at pulling nutrients out of the soil fast. Yes. We have a question sure. online that is asking about how long do you need to solarize for? That's a good question. Um, I don't really know the answer to that. I would say at least a couple months. I would that's say. what I usually tell people when they ask me. Um, and, it, and that's one of the things you could, well, yeah, you could look under it after some time and see, is it yellow? And then if it is, it's probably good. Mm -hmm. You want it kind of crispy. 
Yes. Are there sites that are like I'm? I have a house, <laughs> not acres. You know, is something designed for more small? Yeah, I mean, you could have. I, I I was trying to get a feel for if this was more of like if you got five acres or. No, no, that that's the thing is you could do. You could have a pollinator planting as big as this desk. Mm -hmm. I mean, honestly, you could just have a, a pot, you know, just oh, one pot. <laughs> and that's your pollinators, right? Yeah. So you put some flowering plants in that, just mix it up so there's pollinators all year round, right? So there's something to do. Yeah, well, these like, like clumps, so I was looking for, you know, I'm still, still browsing, but I was just wondering about some of the tools that you're pointing out so that yeah. you can narrow those down to. Oh yeah, you can go okay. really small. And, and a lot of the plants that we talk about don't need to be in a large area. So I think every plant I we talk about, you could have in a like a five gallon container mm -hmm. and that would be fine. Um, another question online, they said, let's be positive and assume that all the pollinator seeds we plant this spring actually grow and flower. Next spring, do we mow down the spent plants? Which I believe we kind of so I would uh, I would wait until after May, and then I would clip. I would I would not. I probably wouldn't mow them. I would just clip the tops off so that the new growth isn't shaded out. Because mm -hmm. if you leave too much dead year after year, the dead's going to fall over and it's going to shade out the rest of the plant. So you do need to remove some of that on occasion. But I would wait until probably end of May before I did that. Or you could do it in the fall after they flowered. Yeah. <laughs> the problem with lilacs though, if you cut them in the fall, they won't bloom in the spring. You cut them right after they bloom. Yes. Yeah. But yeah. if you wait too late, yeah. Right, right, right. Yes. Is there a website or a database where you can register your garden and see you know, land coverage that people have I don't I'm not aware of anything like that like I mean the conservation district is doing some monitoring mm -hmm. um, but I'm not aware of any national there might be there's yeah I, don't know I mean means. pollinators it's a it's a big deal right uh, the whole bee colony collapse and how are we going to keep our plants pollinating without uh, yeah there's I can't remember the name of it but Series there was one of, like, website maybe the Xerxes Society was talking about it but the website oh. did give suggestions for native gardens to visit in your area so I mean I'm assuming those people had to Sacagawea Audubon yeah I think yeah. has some stuff yeah like I yeah I definitely sounds really cool and I can try and put together some resources on that I'm sure someone just did that honestly you folks are probably your best resource yeah. <laughs> honestly um, yes, sir. Um, I'm going to be removing some residential sod for my pollinator sure. crop and have to replace it with soil. Um, is, do you have a recommendation for a particular type of soil I should look for? Um, well, I don't know if my question makes sense. No, it makes total sense. I understand because you're pulling a bunch of stuff out and you want to put stuff back. Yeah. to get it to the right level. Right. Um, so I, silty loam would be kind of an ideal scenario. Um, where you get that is the question. So I know landscapers, you can buy yards of soil yeah. from them. Um, years ago, we, I, was, I worked for a nursery here in town and we had gotten a bunch of soil from a, an outfit and unfortunately that soil had, had chemicals on it and all our seedlings germinating died. I mean, they all came up and they all died. We didn't know what was going on until later. So I would get it from a reputable outfit. Um, I don't know if Western Pines does it. I know they do like mulch and that sort of thing. They're out here in Manhattan, they're local, but I, I'm pretty sure a lot of the landscaping companies would be able to provide some soil, whether or not it's, where they got it and how good it is, um, is another question. Yeah, a couple of years ago, I bought some rep, some soil from a reputable um, uh, outfit in town and it had pesticide in it. And mm -hmm. when, I, when I took 
one of my tomato plants to show them um, what happened because I didn't know there was pesticide. In right. It. Yeah. And their mouth dropped. They probably didn't know either. And yeah. Some plants are they more susceptible to that than others. Apparently, a bunch of other people. Oh, yeah. Well. Yeah. So, you know, that's a tricky. So, unless you have your own source, where you can, I mean, you're never going to really know, I guess, unless you know, you're really clue in. I would imagine bags of soil are, but that gets expensive pretty quick. So, I don't know if I'd recommend that. Is there a way to test? You can bring them to MSU, they will test it for you. MSU Extension, I believe, yeah. will do some testing. There's also a good uh, resource, I don't know if you folks are aware, on campus, it's on the, in the John Scudder building, the Plant Materials Center. They have a diagnostic lab. You can bring in plants and they will tell you either what it is or what's wrong with it. It's right on 11th Street and it's a free service. You can go in, I mean, they won't do, like if you go in every week with a couple of plants, they won't do that. But if you go in once in a while, they would definitely do that for you. It's in the Ag Bioscience Building on 11th Street. What was the name of it? It's in the Ag Bioscience Building, but it's the John Scudder um, Diagnostic Lab. Can you bring dirty okay. too or just plants? I'm sorry? Can you bring dirty too or just plants? So I, I, my understanding there is just plants. Okay. So one thing, I'm glad you just said that, is do you folks know the difference between dirt and soil? There we go. All right, we got it. So dirt's dead. Dirt's dead. So essentially, when we talk about dirt, we're just talking about the mineral components, the sand, silt, and clay. But we want to have some organic matter in there, right? That holds it all together, gives it life. Yeah. So soil. We want soil. You know, we live in Belgrade, and you know, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so there, there's a little rock. <laughs> So, so yeah, well, and then that in that situation, maybe bring in a little bit of soil, and if you can get something just going, um, and then I would recommend obviously if you're on a gravel bed, if you want something that's going to be really drought tolerant, um, that does well in well drained soils, and there are some plants that do better with that than others. Um, I, I'm lucky; I just like pile all my stuff up and let it rot, and then spread it. <laughs> That's enough. Yeah. But, um, I also import, I, I milk goats on weekends. And so I've been like cleaning the stalls, and that's like gold. Yeah. Um, that can be an issue too, though, because so, some chemicals from the dairy. Mm, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm like that's doing a, a um, small dairy. We're, we're talking mm. like under 10 goats. Um, and she's super like organic. You know, don't touch any other goat before you come onto my place. Right. Which is, I mean, that's cool. Yeah. But so I've been like, you know, thinking that was okay. <laughs> yeah, if you can build, you get your own compost going. That's, yeah. You know, that. Yes. We have one more question online, and I think this is an interesting one. They said they already have a mix of native plants and weeds on their plot. What site prep would you recommend? Because I know a lot of what we say is kind of kill everything that's there, but what if they already have some good stuff? Yeah, so then in a situation like that, that's going to be a spot spray or just uh, go to each individual plant with a shovel, I think. Um, I hate to say it, but I, you know, I don't know how large of an area it is. Um, it is difficult to get that going um, if you have existing and you're not starting off straight. Um, so because it's seven o'clock, Thank um, you very much. And, yeah, thank you. So, I'm totally available. Like I said, honestly, I sorry. No, you're all I good. work Go for you folks. So I work for USDA. I know I, I said I'm NRCS, but we're agency under USDA. But your taxpayer <laughs> money goes to my side. So I do work for you. You know, I, our main focus is with agricultural producers and non-industrial forests. We do have the ability to come out to any property um, at any time. <laughs> You know, during working hours to help folks <laughs> address resource concerns. Okay, so if you have something that you just can't figure out and you're up against the wall, please get in touch. We're here to help. We really are. I've lived here and just also, I've lived here for 30 years. So it's not like I'm just someone who 
hey man, I'm working for the government and then I'll be back. This is where I live. Actually, I live in Clark County now. I just couldn't afford to anymore. But uh, don't hold that against me. But we're here to help. Yeah, thank you so much, Chris. And yeah, I just want to be, yeah, big, big round of applause. I just want to be mindful of everyone's time, but of course, like Chris said, and the same goes for us at the Gallatin Conservation District, we're always here to field any questions that you have. Um, my contact information is up here. And if you just Google Gallatin Conservation District, um, we'll come up and we host a, a bunch of other different programs and services. Um, but I will make sure to post this recording on our website. Um, as well as the slides, if you just kind of want to go through slowly and look at some of them individually, and then um, have both Chris and I's um, contacts. And of course, if you reach out to me with a question that I can't answer, I'll bug Chris and get the answer for you. So, so yeah, so we'll probably stop the recording now. Thank you, everyone online. We can't see you, but you were a great audience. Um, no one complained about not being able to hear things, so we're going to go with that went well. Um, yeah, awesome. Thanks for